Thanks for having me along. It's always great to get out and uh, talk to aspiring journalists and, and uni students and things like that. It um, doesn't seem that long ago that I was sitting where you are, uh, but it is. Um, so I finished uni, I studied journalism at Deakin Uni in Geelong. Um, finished that in 98 and was lucky enough to get into the age via a cadetship starting the year after in February 99, so I was pretty young then. I was 20, 21 when I started there. But while I was at uni, just briefly, um, you know, I always knew what I wanted to do was, was to get into the media, whether it be through the papers or the ABC or a t TV station or something like that. You know, I made my mind up, so wanted to get published, wanted to get a portfolio of work, uh, and I still think that's the main game now and a really good thing, although the mainstream media has sort of um, under, been under a lot of pressure with changes in technology and, and reductions in, in our advertising, which pays the bills for, for journalists, pays the salaries. Um, that fragmentation of the media does provide a lot more opportunities to self-publish or to get published through other smaller operations. And generally, from my experience and stuff like that, editors and people hiring don't really care about where stuff's been published. It's more about the effort that's gone into getting a start and to get involved and get yourself out there, get your stories out in the public. And um, that kind of um, intensity and energy and commitment is what they're looking for. So what I can say is if, you, if you're wanting to get a start, get active, get proactive, local papers, you know, community radio, um, you know, you just keep your ears open all the time. There's always people talking about stuff, whether it be at the pub or, you know, I have a listen, you know, little tips that just listen to conversations in cafes in the city. If you're in the legal district, could be a couple of lawyers talking about some big case coming up while they're waiting in line for, to get a coffee. Or if you're up in Spring Street, it could be some public servants or politicians, things like that. So you hear a bit, you know, just make a note of it and go back and do a little bit of work. So it's just always thinking about uh, what opportunities are there and, and, and where to take them. So, yeah, so when I was at uni, I tried to get to get published as much as possible and, as I said, was fortunate enough to get in at the age and then um, did a cadetship, uh, which takes you right through all the areas of the paper, business, sport, Sunday age, all of that. Uh, got put onto the rural round, so I suppose being from Geelong, I was the closest thing they had to someone from the real country. Uh, at the age at the time. That was a great start because, you know, the round got no real profile or no attention paid to it at that time at the age at all. So it was great for me to just hire a car, go out with a photographer for a couple of days, um, play golf, get a few stories, take some photos and come back and, and get them published. But it was a great way to build contacts and to actually build up a round from nothing so you couldn't lose to something that was eventually, you know, getting stories on page one or page three. And it made you think about, okay, how am I going to get this to a city audience? Why should they care? Why is it interesting? So, you know, you're thinking about framing a story and, and with those country jobs, you always had a great opportunity to get terrific photos. And so if you could get a unique photograph that could hold up page one or page three, all of a sudden your stories have got more prominence, people talk about them, and you start building a name for yourself and, and you know, getting better stories as people recognise you, someone to come through. So I did that, moved up to state politics, um, never lost a dictaphone, which is a kind of <laughs> problem for the age. Uh, I spent 18 months, two years there, oh no, longer than that, four years there, um, doing state politics, and it's a really great way to cut your teeth as well. Uh, it's a very busy round, um, so many people, you know, from different sides of politics and in the public service and so many things going on. Uh, you're a lot of ambitious people too, so if you sort of find the ones who are on their way up, there's no point coming into the to the age of the Herald Sun State Rounds Bureau as the number three in the chain of the reporters there and demanding an interview with the Premier the next day. It just, it just doesn't work like that. So you find it sort of find your mark, talk to the people who want to be that person in five or ten years' time making your contacts there, because they've got stories and access to things too, but no one's talking to them. So you start building up from, from a low base. So I did that and, you know, and enjoyed that. Went away for a while, went travelling, and then came back and 
joined our investigative team and at that stage I was the youngest or the most junior person, this is in uh, 2005 in the team, and then we had the first of what was many redundancy rounds and all of a sudden I'd gone from uh, the most junior person to the only one left um, out of that process and then been there since then and the last sort of six or seven years worked really closely with uh, my friend Nick McKenzie um, doing all sorts of stuff and just yeah working together on lots of stories and we find we can tackle a lot more by combining um, effort on stories, combining contacts, sources, bringing each other into um, each other's trust and it also helps us the story writing process too because when you've been investigating something for a long long time before it's come to print um, you get lost very easily and you, you don't know really what the story is anymore and it's great to have that set of eyes that knows enough about it um, to be able to understand it but is not so you know, entrenched in the story and that they can cut through in a couple of days of just reviewing the material and not speaking to you. So, and just review it and come back and say, look, I reckon it's this, this and this. Whereas it might take you three weeks and you still wouldn't be any closer if you were left alone doing it. So that's kind of where I am at now. And, you know, I really enjoy most of the time my job. It has its trials like anything. Um, and I suppose it gets us onto the topic of sources because Sources are people, okay? they're real people out there who have jobs, families, access to grind sometimes, different motivations, but by and large, good stories, stories that change things, that um, you know, bring down governments, that right wrongs, uh, that expose fraud or corruption, or just you know, people being treated in a way they shouldn't be treated by, by authorities or people that should know better, all have a common thing, and that's they start with story. They start with people. The sources are real people. Okay, those documents that might get emailed to you or come in the post box don't just come there by themselves. Someone has to make a decision. And hopefully, you know, most of the time it's in the public interest, but they've got to make a decision to actively take a risk to give you something that may jeopardise their career, their uh, their freedom to work in, in different government bodies, it's a criminal offence to leak certain informa information, even if it is in the public interest, to a journalist without authority. Um, and they can be prosecuted for that. And so, as tempting as it is, and it's, I mean, we all want it, we want that as emails, we want those phone calls. And I could say, you know, even today, uh, as a result of some stuff we did last week on immigration things, we had three or four phone calls this morning from people wanting to tell me stuff but in each time, you have to keep my name out of it, you've got to keep me confidential, you've got to do this. Okay, and so most journalists, because we all want to pursue the story, we do generally agree pretty quickly if someone requests the confidentiality, and, and most of the time it is there for a good reason that they're asking for it. We, we say yes because we're so focused on getting the story. What's the information? You know, it's always tantalising. Now, after doing the job for 15 years, I still get excited by the unknown and the, the prospect of the next. It's like a it's like a drug. It's the next big. You know, you're chasing that next hit all the time. You know, you can be up and then down, and then you want to go up again. So you you follow up and you get excited when someone contacts you with stuff. Um, so, but by agreeing, I suppose by agreeing to take someone into your confidence. Yeah, doesn't come easily for you. Most of the time, no one's ever going to call you out on it, okay? 99% of the time, no one's going to say, um, we want to know who your source is, and we want to know under what circumstances you gave that confidentiality. Did you offer it first, or did they ask for it? When did they ask for it? You've got two other people who wrote this story. Did you tell them about this person? Well, what, aren't you breaching confidence there? All these things, this is what can happen if you get called into court to explain about the interaction with your sources and things like that. So, by all means, recognise that good journalism doesn't happen without good sources. And a lot of the time, you will be called upon to protect them. And a lot of the time, it's good reason. But I guess I can say from experience, it pays to to sit back and, and yes, if you, if you make that decision to commit, then you've got to stand by it. 
but in weighing up the information they provide, think about motivations for doing so. Is it, is it always you know, in the public interest or is it in their own interest? Is it trying to score, settle a score with someone? Does that person deserve it? All those kind of things. So you've got to really almost take the information and go away. And sometimes the information might only be verbal. So if you have someone ring up and say, so-and-so that you wrote about in the paper is a fraudster and has dudded X, Y, and Z investors out of this much money, but you won't find it because he hasn't, the court case has been settled and it was all confidential, something like that. Okay, you want to get it because it involves something you're already chasing, but how do you go about verifying? You can't just go and print the next day and say, an anonymous source who I didn't even know the name was on the end of the phone he said this about this person. I mean, you'll be out of the job and paper will be bankrupt if we all did that every day. So when a source does come through with stuff, often it can take a long time to check out what they're saying. And I suppose that's a really big obligation on you as a reporter as well, is uh, not only if you take them into your confidence, but then you've got to establish whether or not, whether or not what they've told you is, uh, is accurate and true. So there are different ways about going about that. You know, they might have told you something and they might have said, I've got the documents to prove it, but I don't want to give them to you yet. So it's a, it can be a long-term relationship, the journalist-source relationship, before it actually sort of yields any fruit. I can give an example, a story we did a few years ago, which um, was on bribery and corruption at reserve bank companies. Um, the primary and initial source for that, I met this guy in a coffee shop in the city and couldn't believe the story, he had to say that these companies owned and directed by people from the Reserve Bank paying bribes overseas to sell banknotes to various governments. And that was just in the news again recently because of a big suppression order that WikiLeaks um, published uh, about, well, I, can't, I can't even say what it's about here. Um, but, uh, what's my thought? Yeah, this, this guy, so this, the primary source for this story yeah, 2008, met him in a coffee shop near the old age building, told me this stuff, didn't have any documents at the time to prove it, sounded unbelievable, but went away and checked out a few of the names and a few of the things he said, and it had foundation. So we met over a period of time, and he's, he came from a background, he was not a, a natural whistleblower at all, uh, completely opposite, and worked in you know quite secretive government agencies and different things where the press was an enemy, and this was his last resort, and he generally was a public interest leaker. So much so he'd gone to the federal police with the information earlier, and they ignored it, and it was only when we put it on the front page, eight months, nine months after our first meeting, that's how long it took to actually establish what he was saying, but also to win his trust to get some documents that we could you know, hang our hat on for the story. So that, you know, that's an example there it was eight months relationship with this person and that was only the start. Then the relationship obviously continued because once the police looked into it, we had to convince them to say, well, put your money where your mouth is, you know, go and be a witness. You wanted this to happen, you can't just back out of it now. And all sorts of things, um, all sorts of ramifications for that, for him and for us. And in that story, we had, uh, at the end of 2012, was winding down towards a Christmas break and looking forward to holidays and stuff. And we published a story that the federal police had secured a star witness in the prosecution of a number of the executives at these companies, who was their bag man in Indonesia, who would allege that he was paid and that they knew he was being paid to go off and bribe various politicians and officials to do all these deals in the late 90s, early 2000s. So it was a pretty significant development. And so we wrote about it. They signed up this star witness. Anyway, the defence lawyers for the accused executives decided to um, make an issue of it. And we got subpoenaed to appear before uh, the, the magistrate's court and then the county court to um, reveal our sources in the interests of justice. And we faced the prospect then of not enjoying summer um, down the beach, but potentially inside a prison cell, um, and it wasn't wasn't the way I wanted to wind down the year. That's for sure. Definitely thinking a long lunch would have been a lot better. But um, we had that experience, and were fortunate enough to get a 
a stay over Christmas if you like, and then got a really, really smart barrister who found a technical point that they, they'd made a mistake on and that the magistrate didn't have the authority to rule on the thing and the Court of Appeal threw it out. And so we, we lived to fight another day on that score, which is, which is really good. Um, but you see what I mean? There's one story that started what, back in 2008, started with a source, started with someone we needed to take into our confidence who required it, that it took months of coffee and meeting and talking for him to get trust in us and for us to believe enough and establish enough and verify the information that he was providing verbally and, and eventually did provide some documentation to back it up. But we had to do company searches from around the world in different um, legal searches in different languages. We engaged, um, you know, not private investigators if you like, but I don't know, car, sort of people who can find out companies' details and, and searches in, in foreign languages overseas in different parts. So we spent a lot of time and money doing that, but it's an example, I suppose, of where that source journalist relationship can lead to big outcomes, but can also land you in legal hot water years down the track. And then you're on, on the stand asked to talk about who your sources were. Now, he wasn't the source for that story that we wrote six years later, but there were other people in there who we've taken into our confidence along the way. Um, so yeah, most of the time, sources will come forward with, with pretty good intentions, but there are always the people out there who do have a vendetta or an axe to grind or aren't telling you everything. So it's kind of funny in some ways that the person coming forward and giving you what could be a great story, you're almost going to run a, a, like a bit of a verification process of who they are, why they left an organisation without giving away that they're talking to you or their name and you know, do a bit of background research to, to protect yourself and to protect the paper um, from being misled. And you know, there are ways of doing that and always protecting that person's confidential um, request for, to be kept confidential is the primary uh, motive, uh, objective for us. And, on that topic of protecting them, I reckon it's since I started to where we're at now, uh, it's harder than ever to to protect a to protect a confidential source. There's that whole debate. I don't know if you saw it around last week with George Brandis trying to explain what metadata is and isn't, and what's going to be um, caught up in that. But if you think about the way we all communicate these days, it's very hard for a journalist and a source a person who's leaking, say, information in the public interest but risking prosecution or losing their job, or, or worse, you know, personal safety or their family's safety to get a story out there because of the electronic trails that we all leave. If that person contacts you via email and you have a dialogue and keep it up, well, there's a permanent record there that is pretty easy to find out. And as smart as you think you are or as they think they, they are, it can eventually bring you undone. Um, same with phone calls, text messages, Twitter accounts, social media, Facebook. God, if there's that many people, we've been able to get embarrassing photos and things of just because they put stupid stuff, or link people to, to things because of Facebook and who they're friends with and stuff like that. Talking like major crooks who are smart in every other aspect of their dealings and fly under the radar, yet are quite happy to post pictures of themselves posing with people they supposedly have nothing to do with or no relationship with. Um, so that's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a gold mine there. But uh, it's, again, it's about electronics, records, information. So how, how do you protect a source if someone's come forward to you like that? And you know they're very conscious of um, not being exposed for losing, you know, risking losing their job things like that. Well, you, you go back to the old, really old-fashioned methods of face-to-face -face communication. And, you know, you go to places that are a bit out of the way, and it does sound a bit, um, you know, like a bit of a movie script or something like that. But I had one case a few years ago where a guy was a very, very uh, high-level source and in a very, very um, oh, delicate position. This was about four years ago, three or four years ago, when Victoria Police was uh, at loggerheads with itself over Simon Overland and his deputy, Sir Ken Jones. And basically, Overland had made some complaints that, o that Jones had been leaking 
material to the press to damage him. So Overland made that accusation to the Office of Police Integrity and we were able to find out that Sir Ken was now subject of a bugging operation. So you've got the Deputy Commissioner of Police having his house and phone and his wife's phone bugged. And we thought that was in the public interest because didn't think those, his alleged crimes uh, warranted that kind of hysterical reaction. And we, we took a big risk and, and published that story um, without going for anyone to verify it because we knew it to be true. And that's because the sources for it were, were solid gold. Um, but, and that ended the bugging operation the next day, which was a good, an interesting outcome. But um, in, in the process of doing that, or once I got an instruction to meet a particular person, to hop on a train at a certain time from the city, heading out to a suburb, to walk to a certain pub with a newspaper folded under my right arm and sit down and order a pint of Guinness. <laughs> and that's how that person would identify me. And, you know, that was all to avoid being followed, being this, being that. It sounds a bit over the top, but most of the time it's not like that. But um, it was in that case. But uh, that, it's an example of the effort you can go to once you get that source and they're in that delicate position to protect them. So face to face, another really good way is um, sending letters. So just mail, uh, because no one really thinks to look there. It's often sent and backwards and forth, or you can work out a way perhaps when you meet face to face to bring a trusted person who's not at your address and not at their address to be a post box. And again, it's slow and all of that, but it doesn't leave that electronic trace that when a story comes out, the first thing, you know, investigators trying to find leaks or sources of leaks uh, will do is they go and get the, the, the phone records and email records and they triangulate. You know, just work through the numbers and then they'll get the journalist's records who wrote the story and they'll just try and cross-reference numbers with the suspects. So there's nothing there, it's very hard. And then if you get pulled into an interview or asked and say, sorry, I don't disclose my sources, you've protected your source. They're not going to find it unless your source makes a mistake. So these are the sort of things that when you, when you get into the industry proper, um, you really have to think about with, with sources. Um, because failure to protect them, you know, if, if we had a big mainstream media outlet in Australia that gave up a confidential source under legal or police or whatever pressure, well, that would just, that would kill public interest journalism. It would just freeze it. Nothing would happen. Stories wouldn't come out. People would have no confidence to, to talk to the press. Uh, we, we'd never find out about corruption inside big banks or in government bodies, uh, in the police force. Um, you know, stuff in child protection, vulnerable kids, people would feel frightened about releasing information about what's going on or the failures in those systems. So it's a, it's a really big obligation for everyone to uphold, and it costs a lot of money. I'll give you an example of another case we've been involved in. So this other one was a story did back in 2009, and it started with a letter that was written from someone claiming to be a senior uh, person in the Australian defence slash intelligence sort of establishment. It was a very detailed letter. It was about the defence minister at the time, Joel Fitzgibbon, and a Chinese friend of his called Helen Liu. We checked out a lot of stuff and managed to, before publication, ascertain the identity of the author of the letter and confirm that. And a colleague actually had a few meetings with this person. Um, and so we were confident there, and we were able to check out a lot of the information. Great story, and that was fine. It had pretty big ramifications. Fitzgibbon resigned a few months later. When it came out, he hadn't been completely truthful about um, that relationship and another one involving his brother and, and uh, defence, uh, lobbying for defence contracts and different things like that. Anyway, as the time went on, um, or throughout that process, uh, I had... Um, a group, small group of people who seem to know uh, the, the Chinese figures involved in this very intimately and had a lot of information about dealings back in China and in Australia and different payments and, and alleged um, corruption and stuff like that. And it's very frustrating. We were trying to, to get these people to, to come and meet and 
um, show their face, we were able to verify a lot of the information provided over about 10 or 12 months of email exchange, quite robust email exchange, and it led to a number of stories, and uh, eventually provided some documents and things like that, but never, unfortunately, got that face-to-face -face meeting, which is not something I would normally like. Uh, I would much prefer to, to sit down with someone. But we, we made a judgment that enough stuff had checked out, and we were able to ascertain quite a bit from these, these documents and went, to he went ahead with further stories um, and, and you know, in the public interest to get to the heart of what we thought was some you know, foreign intervention in Australian politics and um, published. And anyway, uh, turns out Miss Lou's pretty well resourced, not struggling for a dollar. So, and she didn't like, obviously, us sniffing around, and so put us on the spot and demanded that we reveal our, so our sources. And we've been in New South Wales Supreme Court for four years now, um, spent half a million dollars trying to protect these sources that unfortunately haven't been able to meet face to face. Uh, but we definitely believe, you know, in the information that's been provided. But it's been a pretty interesting experience then when you get into the witness box and cross-examined by a very aggressive QC. Um, the one in this case was used to act for Kerry Packer, so kind of get a picture there of, um, you know, the person's uh, not backwards and coming forwards and, and making accusations about you and your level of ethics and conduct and stuff like that. And, and it's, it's not a fun experience at all because, as I said at the start, you questioned then on, well, you know, who, did you offer confidentiality first? Did they seek it? Well, prove it. Where's it proven? And all the time you're trying to not fall into a trap of identifying or giving any information away that would identify these people, yet you've got to explain and justify your actions and you're on your own up there. And it really, that source journalist relationship um, becomes, you know, the only thing in your mind while that's going on. And Richard, at, what, at what stage is that case well, now? That stays, that is at, so we had, we got ordered, the judge in a pretty sensational decision um, in New South Wales ordered us to disclose, give material that would disclose or help her ascertain the identity of sources uh, on the basis that we as a newspaper had a, six, a potentially successful defence under any defamation act called the Qualified Privilege, which is, allows you some leniency to talk around matters of national importance, public interest, politics, that sort of stuff. And we could have mounted a defence to any defamation action from her by using qualified privilege. So making that judgement, she said Lou's only source of redress was to know our sources and to go after them. And well, we said, well, no, we can't do that. And we appealed and we lost the appeal and then we have gone back and put in an application to say if we give up our qualified privilege defence, which is our best defence, and plead truth, which is a lot harder to, to get over the line in defamation, that gives her a remedy, because we're a big you know, media company opening ourselves up, and it's happened before where the court's disclosed, um, uh, thrown out, sorry, source disclosure uh, rulings, when a media company's done that and we're waiting on a decision there. But also in the meantime, um, a bit of good investigative journalism's uh, given us a little more confidence as well in this case because as this has dragged on, uh, we were able to find out how she got her Australian citizenship and it was through a sham marriage and we found the people involved and I got one of them on the record to make admissions about it was a sham marriage and got the wedding photos and the documents and all of that sort of stuff and gave them to the immigration department, although I don't know whether or not they've got me where uh, investigating, but needless to say, she hasn't set foot back in the country since that story was published, so we'll see what happens there. I just meant to say, the, the stories you write probably put you at more risk than many journalists of having to be in court, asked to give up a source, facing jail. Is this as close as you've been? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so, so again, it's it's a couple of you know high-profile examples, I suppose. It's not, thankfully, it's not the um, the norm uh, for me. But yeah, in that kind of investigative area, you are generally more at risk of that sort of stuff because 
you're often taking on people or institutions um, that have a lot of resources, have a fair bit to hide. Sometimes you give them no choice, you know, but to, you back them into a corner, so you kind of expect that. Um, and so you've got to wear, you know, people got a right to take legal action, I think, if they think they've been defamed, and that's, that's part of the process. And, you know, I'm very confident in that our due diligence and stuff before a story's gone in will prove that we're right or that we've acted reasonably and all that sort of stuff. But I do think going after sources is a bit beyond the pale uh, because they know that that's a weak spot. Um, and I think that's counter to the, to the public interest, and I reckon most, most people in the public agree too with that when you get litigants going after sources. Before I let other people ask you a question, I'm hoping they've got some, because I, I've sort of had a few that came to mind. Journalists will often talk in a very high-minded way about the public interest. Do you have a way that you define it for yourself? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's not what's interesting to the mm. public, although some people try and confuse it like that. I think it's just the old rule of uh, stuff that people, I think if asked or given the opportunity, would you want to know, would you like to know what is going on inside this organisation that is important in your life because of X, Y and Z reason? Uh, I think that's what defines a public interest to me. But there's a benefit from knowing what's going on inside somewhere. Either you're not being told the truth, um, bad stuff's happening and being covered up. Uh, if it gets the sunlight brought in on it, things this isn't going to happen again and things are going to improve. And I think that's what the public interest is about. Mm -hmm. OK, I'll let other people ask a question. Now, because this is being recorded as lectures normally are, it might be that if you ask a question, I'll have to repeat it so that it's picked up by the recording. So, would anyone like to start? Yeah, Mary. Could you expand on that qualified privilege, what the judge was asking you to do? Okay, so we're asking... Was that judge asking you to... You're OK, you've got the qualified privilege that you can tell me. Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah, so we're asking about uh, legal qualified privilege as a defence to a defamation action with a bit of like... This will be good because we can talk about this again in a couple of weeks as well. So. Um, no, the, the judge was on qualified privilege was saying that if uh, the person wanted to sue you for defamation, in this case, you had a defence of qualified privilege. Oh, okay. Yeah, so therefore that's why the sources were needed to be made available because you could defend an action, but this person needed to have the ability to take action, so who's next? Sources. That's all. Yeah. Um, in terms of what the age can offer you with support and legal support, um, obviously they constantly run the risk of you guys being in court. So how do they, is there some kind of legal process that you go through with the newspaper before yeah. you then get backed by them financially? Yeah. yeah, so it's a question of what legal and financial backing the age can give to protect its investigative reporters. Yeah, we've put a few lawyers' children through private school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In recent years. No, we've got, we get looked after by Minter Ellison, so the media law guys there, which is uh, Peter Bartlett, David Porton, and, and their team, and they're, they're two of the best guys in the business, you know, across the country and, and internationally. So, process there is, uh, for example, before I came here today, uh, just drafted a story for something perhaps later this week, where we've had a few... Um, legal threats but no no writs or anything like that where people have you know tried to get us to back off a story because they know it costs money and that media companies aren't making a lot of money so we're finding more and more uh, you know people who are subject of a story just fire off a legal letter the next day to kind of put you on the back foot a bit so yeah I just email them a draft and they go through it and we talk about what have we got that backs this up and, and all of that so pretty much every story it goes through that process and then major you know major hits or major series um, you'll sit down perhaps spend half a day with David Peter or, uh, or both um, and go through what you've got what our risks are they look at the copy make some changes to take stuff out change this word here 
and then the decisions made by the editor really, um, whether or not to publish on the advice of the lawyers. Then they give them a risk, and, and it is, it's part of the business. Mm. Yeah, they'll evaluate what the re they think the risk is and what they think might happen. Yeah. Just one up the bat. Yeah, Richard, appreciate your time. Obviously, it's a um, pretty important day in the Essendon saga. I find it interesting that you're here at the moment after writing extensively about it. I guess my question is, as an investigative journalist, do you find it hard to detach and move on to the next thing before some of these things have played out? Uh, oh, sorry, no, sorry, oh, sorry, it's just a question about the Essendon saga and Richard's had a bit of a role in, um, in writing stories about it. Yeah. Hard to be detached. It, it is hard to take yourself away from different things. I haven't taken myself, I mean, I haven't been writing on it that much lately, only because there's been a million other things on the go and we've, you know, the papers made the decision to assign um, some of our sports writers like John Perry and stuff to cover the day in, day outs of it. Now we've got, a, like all of the rest of the media, there's a big crew down there in court today and I suppose with with me and with Nick, um, we, we, like it's a kitchen if you like, you know, in a hot plate there's probably like eight different stories cooking or boiling away at different levels. And so, if we were to same the same thing, we didn't cover the um, the court cases with these Reserve Bank people being prosecuted because if we did, I'd be covering a court case for two years, and that's all I could do, and I couldn't do any other things. And so, we make a judgment that we try and stay involved where we can, but there's so much other stuff to get involved in, um, and the, the football, the Asada thing, really happened by. By chance, how we got involved in that was uh, by accident, not design, if you like. It was basically the day after self Essendon self-reported, I had a contact of mine who rang up and said, oh, I know the bloke who was supplying them with, with their peptides and all of that sort of stuff. You might want to check him out. It was Shane Charter, um, who was the guy he was referring to. And said, "Yeah, he's got a, you know, he's got a drug trafficking conviction and all that." And so, naturally, day one after they've reported, and there's this big storm and all these questions there. Um, if we can write the story about who was supplying, and and Shane Charter's history and different stuff, and then it just snowballed. So it just, you know, went on from there. But we were just uh, like everyone else on the first day, just interested bystanders. But that said, there are the other stories potentially coming not too far down the track. Related to to Asada issues and, and things like that. Yeah, we'll see. We're going to see what see what we can get through the lawyers. Other, yeah. Uh, at what point do you have a look at um, uh, in terms of public interest? Do you look at you might have some information about a politician, but it's a personal detail. You know, you might have had an affair or something. What? How do you look at those sorts of? Um, those tip-offs that you get, and then you say, look, we're not going to gain much by publishing, we're just going to make an enemy. How do you go about doing personal things like that, and what is actually a story in the public interest? Oh, sorry, I'll, yeah, I'll repeat that for the, for the sake of the record. Um, so the question was about if, for example, you got a, uh, some personal details about a politician, uh, something that would be highly embarrassing, how do you decide whether or not it's in the public interest? And we could probably look at that that David Campbell, the New South Wales Minister, um, exposure as yeah. an example of one way of doing that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it would depend on a case by case thing, but as a rule, my, my personal view on it is um, you don't don't go near that sort of stuff. If it's just if it's not affecting their job and they're not, you know, if it was say Fred Nile, the Reverend Fred Nile, the great family values. Campaigner, it turns out, you know, he's like the most popular guy on Tinder or something like that. Well, I think that would probably be a story because he's not practicing what he preaches. But if it's just a normal politician who's, you know, having an affair or whatever, and you know, or he's got problems in his relationship um, or her relationship, you who know, am I to judge? I don't think it's relevant unless it really impacts um, their ability to do their job. And most of the time, it doesn't. It's got nothing to do with it. The David Campbell case in um, New South Wales is a really interesting one where I think the, the media got it totally wrong. So he was a, a New South Wales government minister um, and he's a, he's a homosexual guy and they followed him to some, you know, a, 
Ken, Ken's, Ken's Ken's and Ken's and Ken's is just a, you know just a, a mm. brothel for gay blokes and uh, and justified the story on the basis that once or twice he used his MP his fun, you know his car that he's entitled to as a, as a parliamentarian to drive there. And I think it was a pretty flimsy basis for a story of um, of no real public interest at all, and all it did was shame the bloke for choosing to you know to express himself that way. Big deal. I had one which, in a way, I'll be sort of asking on behalf of the students, is dealing with local councils. I mean, for many of the people here, they're the sorts of general community sources you yeah. deal with. I would imagine some would be easier than others, but are there any experiences you've had in having to deal with local government in Victoria? Yeah, yeah, for local councillors and, um, you know, the sort of executives or management of councils over the years for, for various stories. Uh, can you say they're, they're, um, they're a different kettle of fish uh, and sometimes you can strike it really lucky and get uh, more than you bargain for in you know, terms of a you know, response to questions or you pick up the phone and you can just ring planning officer and they might just have a chat to you, you know, you disclose who, yourself, who you are. You're quite free to talk, they don't feel as Restrained as, as others in maybe other other levels of government. Then at the other at the flip side, you can just get you could ask thirty questions and get a no comment. So they're kind of it's like a uh, a lucky dip in my experience. It depends on the council. It depends on the the makeup of the council at that time and, and the issue. But certainly it's a very fertile area, um, and particularly for aspiring journalists and. You know, local journalism, there's so much going on that's not covered. I mean, local newspapers these days often don't have the resources to send someone to the Wednesday night council meeting, and, and they used to, you know, and that's where reporters used to get some great stories, but also build up some contacts, you know. So those councillors and the people there, they're, they're on their way up often too. You know, that's the start, stepping stone to a career in either federal politics or state government or, or whatever and same with you know some of the officers they, they don't want to be working for the um, you know the Yarra Council for the rest of their lives and things like that so if you get onto a story or think there's something worthwhile checking out you take the time to go down and, and make the effort to, to sit in and hear stuff and then introduce yourself afterwards and, and also make the call like if you've got assignments and different things where you obviously need to, to ask people questions Ask for a cup of coffee, ask to go and see them, you know. Um, don't just email four questions out of the blue because you'll get not much of an answer. But try and build a relationship. I reckon that's the, the key to, to good journalism is um, building and maintaining relationships across a wide variety of people because that's how you build up your source pool. And that's what happens when you get a tip. So, for example, one of the reasons why we're able to check out and, and build upon good tips is has maintained and built this pool of sources over the years. And if you actually take the effort to not just milk them when you need it, but you know, you're walking past so and so's building and they work in the city, you know, I haven't caught up with so and so for a while. Ring him, say, hey, are you free? I'm just passing. Can you come down and say you've got time for a coffee for 15 minutes? And you don't have a chat about work necessarily. You ask them about their kids or what they're doing. And then they might say, oh, yeah, I'm doing this really interesting thing. I shouldn't tell you, but in six weeks we're going to do. And you go, oh, really? That's interesting. And then you walk off, make a little note, six weeks, call them up. Hey, you remember when we had that coffee? And then, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not milking them, but you're maintaining a relationship. And it's just human nature, people talk. So anyway, that's probably the best bit of advice I can give is, is do stuff face to face. Well, that was, the other, that was going to lead to my other question. And I'm asking very self-serving ones here, but email interviews, questioning, so on. I mean, I, see problems with it, but it might be that you find a lot of effective use of emails for I do, information. Yeah, yeah. Email is so we've had a big discussion internally actually because of this whole uh, dictaphone going missing thing and issue of you know consent and recording people uh, on the phone. And now I don't do that um, more just because I can't be bothered listening back for all the have got time to do it and you know I've got okay shorthand but if it is a couple of exceptions over the years I've, I've made a special effort to 
make a recording of stuff when I know a story is going to be legally contentious and I know that this person or suspect that this person would lie about what, they've, what they're saying now, they deny that they've said it. So I, I've recorded a few conversations there where I've not used it for the story, never written what's in the, in the conversation, never broadcasted it, but have kept it in my back pocket in the event of legal action and there is a loophole um, in the Act that allows you to do that so long as you don't broadcast it for those things. Or you get smarter as time goes on and technology allows you to use Bluetooth and get in your car, put it on speaker and then use another recorder and then you don't have to worry about whether it's a legal recording or not because you haven't plugged anything into the phone. So it's technicalities. We're getting back to your question on email. So I reckon what is a really safe way of, of doing business for yourself and whoever you're writing about is you ring up and you, you can have an off-the-record chat and you can explain and, and give context to what you're looking at and why you're going to be asking questions. There's an opportunity for the, that person or that company or entity to engage in an off-the-record way that they can't say things publicly but can help provide a, you know, another side to the story, give you some context. So often, if they engage in that process, it softens things a bit too. You know, you don't have to directly attribute, but you get a sense of both sides of the story. And then you can, then what I do is submit, you know, X amount of questions in writing after that discussion that are their formal responses, and they're what we'll use in the copy to attribute to them. And then both sides have a record because no issue of misquoting because they've written it, they've typed it, it's been read by whoever needs to authorise it, they've sent it to you, you've got a copy, and unless you make a mistake cutting and pasting or whatever they answer in, it should be, everyone knows where they stand. So that's how I do it. Make the phone call or go and have the chat, do that off the record, and then put in your formal questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this has been published or not, but um, did the age take any kind of uh, disciplinary action with Farah Thomason? Like what happened there? Like, so we're asking about the Farrah Thomas and lost dictaphone, was there No, I don't think so. No, not that I'm aware of. No, I mean, I think she would have been told to take more care right. to, to make sure her stuff doesn't go missing. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm not, you know, not aware of anything else. I mean, it was just unfortunate. Um, the whole thing could have been avoided, I think, if people just hand back stuff when it's clearly marked who owns it, then it wouldn't have been an issue. I mean, what we've been, well, what I've been preaching in classes, I've been saying, when you're doing this sort of stuff, you should really assume people possibly will make mischief with things if it, if it goes awry. You can't sort of necessarily assume goodwill. No, you can't assume goodwill. Um, you know, I, yeah, wouldn't take out a bag full of documents. If I was going to the pub on the way home from work or something, just leave it in my locker at work or, or whatever because it can easily happen, you know, you can misplace stuff and and what we've been talking about at the start of this is about protecting the sources. Well there, there goes that commitment. How, how do you think that will affect her career? Uh, it will we'll probably it will no doubt have some short term impact I'd say, up in that environment, you know, because it's a pretty small world, Spring Street and state politics. Um, hopefully it won't have a longer term impact because you know, I know Farrah and she's a really straight person and, and, um, and, a, and a good journalist. Um, so it's, it's an unfortunate thing that's happened and it, and it may, may cause some short term problems up there. I think it would be naive to suggest otherwise. Are there any other questions we had there was one I was going to ask you, so I think we found a story, um, it was you and Nick McKenzie might have been making a speech, it might have been a public interest type speech, in which you described having written stories about, is it Dr. Uh, Cosman. Cosman? Yeah. And you've been injured at least once, if not twice, playing oh, footy yeah. or in the hospital. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, this is, um, <laughs> um, we had to do it uh, in February, in, no, February, in May, a talk up in Sydney for the, uh, the Journalists Union of Media and Entertainment Arts Alliance. It was Press Freedom Day, World Press Freedom Day. We had to give an address at a function up there, which was raising a lot of money um, for the families of, I think it was 40, 37 or 40 journalists in the last 12 months in Asia Pacific murdered or killed for, for doing their job, and about 137 around the world. 
in that 12 months. So, you know, thankfully, it's a pretty safe place, Australia, to, to do that compared to a lot of other places. And in that address, yeah, it touched upon these stories back in 2008. So he was a, uh, the head of the Alfred Hospital's trauma department and we've got some allegations there about um, oh, excessive surgery, I suppose, on patients and um, some surgery perhaps outside the bounds of, of um, qualifications and then some billing to insurers to, to maximise income. And did the story, it was pretty controversial at the time. Um, and unfortunately, I had managed to injure myself pretty badly twice that year playing football and required to, um, the services of the Alfred. And uh, yeah, so I remember once I was going under anaesthetic to have a broken wrist um, repaired and they were asked, the anaesthetics and the anaesthetists and the doctors were asking, oh, are you that guy writing those stories? So what do you think about the prof? And just sort of drifting off to sleep and wondering whether or not I'd wake up with two left hands or something like that. Um, that was all right. And then, yeah, there was another time later, later in the year, unfortunately, uh, I had to go back in there for something else and similar questions. So it was certainly a very divisive one, but they're, they're, they were true professionals. Oh, well, that's no, good. So I was about advice. to say to Kurt, to me, that no, well, there, was, yeah. there, there was some, well, some people probably would have said go harder, and others would have said you're, you're being unfair. So. It occurred to me doctors can do more damage to you than uh, lawyers, but they probably wouldn't. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah probably right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Richard, for coming along and talking to us. I hope you guys have been, uh, I guess, noting in the back of your minds, this is how I can get stories in my area. Obviously enough, the people in the Ages investigative team are going to be doing stories of national importance. For us, a lot of the time it's going to be at the local council, but the local council's a really fertile place. And you're right, it is a, it's a training ground, isn't it? It's, it's where people start off. Oh, it is, but yeah, and it's important to, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of people who live in the area. It's mm. very important to, to lots of people. Uh, so, yeah, don't underestimate. That, oh, just, just get stuck in wherever you, wherever you can. If you really want to do it, just just start start doing it. That's all. And don't be shy and about getting people saying no. More often than not, most people will talk to you. Well, okay. And on on that note, we'll say thank you very much, Richard. If we can uh, thank you for coming along.